Yeah. <coughs> Didn't you see him come across there, boy? All of them dogs jumped out. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Max knows. Yeah, he's, he's fair he's game. safe there. All right, Bob. <laughs> okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody here this morning. It's a beautiful day outside here in Virginia, and uh, we hope that wherever you're viewing from, that you're having a great morning or maybe afternoon, whatever the case might be. But well, we're glad that you've joined us. We, uh, we invite anybody into our into our family room here for our worship service. And of course, uh, what we want to do is we want to begin with prayer. So let me invite you, uh, wherever you might be, just to pause for a minute, and let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the beautiful week that you have given us. It was a great opportunity to get outside and enjoy uh, some beautiful weather, or to get some things accomplished. And so we're thankful, Lord, that you... Uh, Bless us in so many wonderful ways, even with giving us nice, sunny, cool days. And uh, we want to thank you for the opportunity we have now to come together as a group here locally and for those who are joining us around the world online. We're, we're grateful, Lord, that we can pause from our busy schedule and take time to open your word. It's something that you have reminded us, of, reminded us to do. Uh, you say that to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And so, Father, we want to honor you in that regard, and we want to utilize this day to bring glory and honor to your name. So we pray for the Holy Spirit to come and to teach us, to inspire us, to help us to be ready for uh, these last day events that we've been talking about over several weeks. And, and, Father, most importantly, that you would prepare us for what lies ahead, and that you would simply use us in the finishing of your great work. So accomplish that uh, in us. Uh, may this be... May this be a new start in that direction if we, if we haven't been going that way. And we ask all these things in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, it's great to see you guys. As always, hope you had a great week. We, uh, we had a busy week. And, <clears throat> you know, when, when you have a really busy week and uh, you haven't had an opportunity to, to maybe study and prepare like you should, um, I want you to, to realize that that uh, in, in doing a, a home church in a home church setting, it's it's actually quite simple, and it doesn't have to be complicated. So what I want to do is I want to share with you. Since I had a really busy week this week, I didn't have time to really get in depth in a lot of uh, a lot of things that uh, we've been dealing with in the past. But I do want to continue talking about some things related to end time events. Now, one of the things that we uh, encourage folks that, that view online to do is to send in their questions and uh, comments and so forth. One of, our, one of our faithful viewers from out Pacific Northwest, uh, named Scott, sent us a great study this past week on the uh, state of the dead and uh, what happens to a person after they die. It's quite extensive. In fact, uh, I'll, uh, I'll check with Scott to see. I'm sure he wouldn't mind that if anybody's interested in this, we would be happy to send along a copy. Uh, put a lot of uh, a lot of forethought, a lot of study, a lot of time into this, and uh, it's what the Bible has to say about folks that have died. And a very important, very important subject. Not many people realize that that's an end time. That's an end time subject. Um, the state of the dead. And what makes it an end time? What do you think makes it an end time subject? Why is the subject of the state of the dead an end time? Why is it part of an eschat? Why would it be part of an eschatology series on last day events? I think it's, it's uh, I believe that the devil will use things like seeming to conjure up the dead and things like that. Perhaps that. Uh, okay. um, <coughs> mediums. Pardon me. Mediums. Mediums. Um, we, we talked a little bit in the past about two particular subjects that uh, the enemy will use to kind of rally the world together, to bring the world together, uh, to try to, to get everybody kind of on the same page, get everybody moving in the same direction. What were those two things that we, that we talked about in the past? <clears throat> One of those is the, um, the counterfeit Sabbath. Right, the uh, the Sunday the sa Sunday sacredness, I guess we could call it, but the worship of the <coughs> worship on Sunday, the sun, the Sunday, and the other is spiritualism. So you have the fa a false Sabbath, 
that will be used to bring the world together, and you have also spiritualism that will bring the world together. Now, the, uh, the counterfeit Sabbath is something that is pretty obvious. You know, Scripture comes out and says that we are to, to uh, uh, worship God, remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy. And yet, what do most, what do the majority of Christians in the United States do? They go on Sunday. Okay, they say, don't, uh, don't worry about the Fourth Amendment. It's done right. away with. Yes. Right. Most Christians in this country, in the United States, they worship on Sunday. And even around the world, you have a lot of people that worship on Sunday. Also around the world, other parts of the world, you have a lot of people that worship on Friday. Okay, the Muslim faith uh, honors Friday. Well, at some point, as we move toward the end, um, there'll be a call, there'll be a move, a push to bring everybody together on Sunday. Okay, that'll be established as uh, kind of a uh, certainly in this country it'll be established first, and then and then then a global push to make Sunday the day of worship. Now, <clears throat> now why is that happening? Why is that happening? Think back of the things we've talked about in the past. Why is why is that happening? What would be wrong with worshiping God on on any day? Well, you're supposed to worship God every, every day, but he says to remember, the fourth commandment says to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy. For in six days, I create the heaven and the earth and everything within it. He is, the fourth commandment shows that he is the creator, he is the ruler, and he is the sustainer of everything out there is throughout the universe. Right. The Bible calls... Uh, the first six days of the week calls them working days. Six days shall you do all of your work. But, but, the seventh day is, is the Sabbath, it of, is the the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It kind of belongs to Him. It has His thumbprint on it. It's totally His. And uh, the weekly cycle... And it distinguishes for, who He is. Right. The weekly cycle was established at creation. And, of course, the seventh day, the Sabbath, was uh, the day when we were to come apart. It was Adam and Eve's first full day of life. They were created on the sixth day, and then God brought them together as man and woman, husband and wife, brought them together, and then they, their first full day together as a married couple was in honor of the, worshiping on the Sabbath. And that goes to show that it's God's Sabbath and not man's. It's God's Sabbath. That's because right. God's Sabbath is man's first day. Okay, and so why would there be a push to go and worship God on a different day? It's too obvious, right? Just to get people doing something that's, that is out of harmony with the will of God. You know, God's will is to worship on Sabbath, seventh day of the week, which we call Saturday in, in several, uh, over a hundred different languages. It, it, it means the same thing. But just to get God's people derailed, just to get people, humanity derailed, a, a spurious, a counterfeit time of worship. You know, people have, uh, a lot of people have a desire to worship, but of course, they uh, they're they're being led and pushed, and then sometimes even forced and manipulated to worship. It'll come down to that. Uh, there'll even be a death decree, uh, as Scripture brings out. We've talked about that in the past in our series. So you have this this uh, the only the only way to get rid of the only way to to uh, get rid of remember the Sabbath to keep it holy is to smooth aside to set aside the law of God. And that's what we see has actually happened within Christianity today. They have um, they, they've decided, the theologians have decided that the law of God is no longer necessary, it's no longer, it's, it's antiquated, it's Old Testament, you know, it's not New Testament. And, and yet, what's the greatest evidence that the law of God could not be set aside, could not be abrogated, or, or, or done away Christ with? Christ death. Okay, Christ dying at Calvary is the greatest evidence. It's actually... If it could have been done away with, it could have been done eight for his day. It's irrefutable proof that the law of God could not be set aside, could no. not be annulled, could not be abrogated, could not be pushed aside, right? That's the greatest evidence. So mm -hmm. if you believe that Christ came and died at Calvary, that's proof positive, no question, proof that, it positive, could not be done away that, with. that the law could not be done away with. Okay. The law stands, and the Christ, the uh, Bible says the wages of sin is death, in Romans 3.23. And so, uh, wages of sin is, is death, and so Christ became sin for us, therefore he paid that ultimate price. 
And we know that he not only gave us human life, but he also sacrificed his omnipresence. He had to have that eternal uh, sacrifice included as well. Well, we've talked about that uh, to some extent, but we haven't talked really a lot about the other. Uh, we have the Sabbath that, that will be used. We haven't talked a lot about the other aspect, and that is spiritualism. Okay. And what I want to show you um, today is really how easy it would be. You know, we want to encourage people, particularly people that may uh, be a little bit disillusioned with the standard uh, congregational type, denominational type uh, you know, church environment, we want to encourage you to get some people together, sit down in your family room, or your living room, and uh, just have a little study like this. And it's very simple to do, and I want to show you how easy it can be done. But uh, remember, anybody that wants to uh, get a copy of Scott's study, very good study on the state of the dead, uh, please remember to uh, write to us about that. We'll first get his permission. Yes, we'll definitely we'll double check with him on that. But let me, uh, let me share with you, I've got a little book here, uh, this one's called Triumph of God's Love. This is the great controversy, and uh, this is a, another thing we'd like to offer. If anybody is interested in uh, this book that deals with uh, the, the uh, development of the papacy and the counterfeit Sabbath and all that kind of thing, uh, and end time events uh, called the great controversy, we'd be happy to send you out a copy of that. So again, you can write to us and request a copy of the great controversy and we'll send it to you free of charge. Uh, in chapter 34 of this book here, uh, this is a, a nice hardback set here. Uh, what we would send out would be a paperback version. Okay, But it talks about can the dead speak to us. And th this is an end time issue, folks. It really is an end time issue. It says the doctrine of man's consciousness in death, especially the belief that, that spirits of the dead return to minister to the living, has prepared the way for modern spiritualism. You know, when we think about spiritualism, um, it contains the word spiritual. So, you know, what would be wrong? What would be wrong? What's, what's wrong? Well, isn't spiritualism, wouldn't that be a positive thing? Well, wait a minute. What's the first thing when everything, when you mention the word spiritualism, what's the first thing that you think of? Seances. You know? Okay. I Perhaps mean, that, that is... That's the first thing you start thinking of. Wait a minute now, and what's these seances? What's it, what's it all about? You're talking to the dead. Talking to the dead. Now, this is something that has really become uh, kind of mainstream. It's become very logical for folks, even in Christian circles, because of the doctrines that many churches promote and teach. It's become very commonplace. <laughs> Um, you can even go, uh, I mean, they even have reality TV shows dealing with people communicating with lost relatives and friends and that kind of thing. Very big, very, very big. Well, um, this has become, this has become a, uh, this will, will be a critical end time issue about uh, uh, can we communicate with the dead? You know, what happens to a person when they die? And, you know, the Bible's not silent on this. Uh, the Bible gives us a lot of information, and we need to be aware of uh, what it really says. But let me share with you just a couple, of, of, um, a couple of, of statements from here. I want you to understand the logic that people use <clears throat> and why they use it. So the doctrine of man's consciousness in death. In other words, you're, after you die, you're, you're not dead. You're still somewhere in the spirit realm, living on, okay? Uh, especially the belief that spirits of the dead return to minister to the living has prepared the way for modern spiritualism. If the dead are admitted, now notice the logic here, okay? If the dead are admitted, admitted to the presence of God and holy angels, and privileged with knowledge far exceeding what they before possessed, why should they not return to the earth to enlighten and instruct those that are still living? So you, see, you see the logic there? In other words, if, if people after they die, they go someplace, or, or, uh, supposedly to heaven, and they're in the presence of God, they're in the presence of holy angels, in the environment in heaven, and, and, and now they have a, a different perspective on things because of where they are, and they have an enlightened perspective, why shouldn't they be able to come back and help those who are still living? Let me, let me read this first paragraph that Scott wrote. 
It says here, For years I've wondered if we Christians go directly to heaven when we die, why are the dead in Christ resurrected on the last day to be caught up in the air with him if they are already there? Do they go back to the respective graves just before the big show? That doesn't make any uh, sense nor seem spiritually sound. So, yeah, a lot of people, uh, like Scott, a lot of people are coming to the conclusion that, um, you know, the Bible talks a lot about the second coming of Christ. And what he's bringing out there is if, uh, <clears throat> if Christ is going to come back, and the dead are going to be resurrected, and the living are going to be translated, you know, if, if they're already there in heaven, if the dead are already there in heaven, um, why would God need to come back here uh, only to resurrect bodies, okay? I mean, he would only have to come back to get those who are still living, right? Right. Okay, he wouldn't have to do it. There wouldn't have to be any resurrection. And so people are asking, they're wondering, well, why, why is there a need of a resurrection? Well, if your case was already decided, why doesn't he just take your body up to begin with? I mean, why do you even have to die? I mean, at the point where you should die, why doesn't he just appear and take you up and... Yeah, right. so they're... they're See, the, them, but that's what <clears throat> most people believe actually happens. See. Well, they look for, like, the rapture, or... Yeah. yeah, they believe. See, they, they 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 believe that they go directly to heaven. That's it. Oh. Well, the the fact is that most people have a, a belief system because of what they're being taught and told from their their church or their pastor. But yeah. see, that's the whole problem. They're not right studying there, enough. They're not studying enough. For the uh, that, that's it, right there. You see, they're taking an individual's word for this without studying it out for themselves. Okay, let me just continue here. It says, if as taught by popular theologians. Spirits of the dead are hovering about their friends on earth. Why should they not be permitted to communicate with them? I mean, that's a logical question to ask, right? To warn them against evil or to comfort them in sorrow. Uh, how can those who believe in man's consciousness and death reject what comes to them as divine light communicated by glorified spirits? So, you, you, you can see the logic here. If you believe that you go somewhere after you die, then shouldn't the living then be able to take advantage of that. Okay? That just seems like a logical argument. Mm -hmm. But what's the fallacy? The fallacy is the foundational belief that after you die, you go somewhere. That you have some immortality, uh, mm -hmm. inherent immortality. But what does Scripture plainly tell us? God Only immortality. God hath immortality. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the saints will be rewarded. The saints, you know, once Christ comes, the saints will be rewarded with the gift of immortality. You know, I mean, it's kind of a conditional that, immortality. We have to eat of the tree of that'll life. Be, yes, that will be perpetu perpetuated by eating of the tree of life. Okay? So, so here's what it says. It says, here's a channel regarded as sacred through which Satan works for the accomplishment of his purpose. So, in other words, this is a scheme <clears throat> that he has. We have to remember that humanity is caught. We're, we're caught in the middle of a supernatural warfare. Right? And that means that uh, miracles uh, can be very commonplace, but a miracle does not mean necessarily that it comes from a holy, righteous source, does it? Because who else can perform miracles? Other supernatural beings. Now, we have, we have two, two classifications of supernatural beings, right? We have, obviously, the good angels, the angels that dwell with God in heaven in His presence. Where do the other ones come from? Where, where do the evil angels come from? Okay, well, how did they end up becoming evil angels? Fallen Satan. Okay, they, they, they lived in heaven originally. Satan, who used to be Lucifer, actually, he was one of the covering cherubs right at the throne of God. When he rebelled in heaven against God's law, incidentally, uh, he was kicked out of heaven eventually, right? And his angels. And his angels were kicked out with him. Okay? So you have all of these supernatural beings that God had created were originally holy, originally righteous, originally dwelt in heaven. Now they are down here playing us, okay, scheming, and uh, causing us to believe things that are not scriptural, that are not in the Bible. Okay? And so it's important for us uh, as Christians to know what this book says. Most Christians, uh, unfortunately, do not realize what is in the book. They don't realize what's in the book. And so that's why we, we have, uh, you know, that's why Scott has done a study, God has impressed him to do a study like this. Because he knows that it's important to understand what's in the book. Okay? Let me go on here. It says, um, the fallen angels 
who do Satan's bidding appear as messengers from the spirit world. While professing to bring the living into communication with the dead, the prince of evil exercises his bewitching influence upon their minds. And so, if you, if you end up accepting the, the false teaching that once you die, you have something inside of you that keeps living on, okay? Once you, once you go that far, once you, once you believe that, uh, then you are, you are open prey. You're, uh, <laughs> you're vulnerable uh, to uh, these other things that will come along. Now, now, what's the end game here, right? What's uh, what would be Satan's purpose in uh, deceiving people into believing that inside of you there's something that doesn't die, that that, that you have an, a people call it a, a soul, an immortal soul. What's what's the what's the end game here? What well, would be in, his purpose? In, in Genesis, in Genesis three, it, it says that it, it, it God told Adam, said you will. Know, Die, but Satan says, "You <clears throat> not going to surely die." You know, you just <clears throat> sort of go to sleep, and then you'll be someplace else. Okay. So, what, what's the danger in believing that? What, what's he was uh, trying to convince them? It don't make no difference. Go your way, you know. What do you think the danger is in in, in believing that? There's something inside of you that won't die. Why, why is Satan working so hard? Remember, false Sabbath and spiritualism, the two things that will bring the world together under his banner at the end of time. Okay? Um, there will be a lot of other diversity amongst people, but those two things will bring them together. So what's the danger? What's the, what's the end game? Why, why is Satan working so hard to convince people about that? you think? <clears throat> it says here, it says, uh, when they have been led, when, when people have been led to believe that the dead actually return to communicate with the living, Satan causes those to appear who went to the grave unprepared to be happy in heaven and even occupy exalted positions. So in other words, if, if, uh, if a person had a questionable life as a human being. Questionable and, character. Questionable character, maybe they were involved in some things, shady things. And supposedly, you know, I mean, almost at any funeral, the, the, the preacher will preach them into heaven, um, no matter how they live. No matter, yeah, no matter how they live. All right, so they, they preach them into heaven. But then, if people believe that these people come back and communicate and say, hey, you know, we're there, we talked to so-and-so, we... We were having a wonderful time. We're in this position, you know. We're. What kind of message does that send? We can live any way you want. You can live any way you want. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make any difference. In fact, you know, this is an antiquated, out-of-date book. It doesn't. It doesn't even even matter what it says. Uh, you know, God's going to take us all there anyway, no matter what. Uh, have you ever heard the uh, the saying, "All roads lead to"? Rome. All roads lead to the kingdom. Okay. <laughs> all, you know, no, no, no matter what you believe, no matter what you believe, all, all roads kind of lead to the kingdom of God. And is that true? No. What does Scripture he say? He says there's one way. One way. One. And that's a narrow road too, isn't it? You know, there's a broad road that leads where? To destruction. destruction. To destruction. There's a narrow road that leads unto life and life eternal. Okay. So, the only way you're going to get on the narrow road is to open this book and to, it's like a road map. And to take the course that the Bible sets out for you, okay. All right. So there's this there's this uh, message that the enemy is trying to convey that uh, despite the errors and despite the character, there really is no difference from God's perspective between the righteous and the wicked. Everybody's going to end up kind of in the same place, okay. Um, it says, then as confidence is gained, you see, uh, Satan's angels, they observe and so forth, so they, they, know, they know how to play us and whatnot. They could even come and communicate to us things that are correct, things that we know that are correct. And so what does that do? Strengthens your faith. That strengthens your resolve to believe in what they're doing. 
And it says, then, as confidence is gained, they present doctrines that directly undermine the faith of the Scripture. So, see, once, once a person has some confidence in you, they can weave into that things that are not true. Okay? And, of course, it's whose responsibility is it to understand what the truth is? It's our own responsibility, isn't it? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. It's our responsibility to get in here and to find out what it says. And that's what we're doing. <clears throat> Just a, a couple of other quick comments here. Um, it says, The work of dealing with familiar spirits was pronounced an abomination to the Lord. And, you know, unless you're in the book, unless you go into the book, you don't realize that this whole subject of speaking to the dead, and Larry mentioned the seances, and trying to communicate with those that have gone, gone beyond, that was pronounced an abomination in Leviticus 19, right? It was solemnly forbidden. What was the penalty if you were involved in it? It was death. You were stoned. In the Old Testament, if you were found to, to be messing with this, necromancing and, and, and this kind, you were stoned. Okay? Leviticus 19 talks about that. The very, na the very name of witchcraft is now held in contempt. It says, The claim that men can hold intercourse with evil spirits is regarded as a fable of the dark ages. You know, people kind of make light of this subject. Um, you know, we think, well, you know, there are witch doctors and there's uh, all this voodoo stuff going on. And, but that's in, in, in third world countries, you know, where they don't have running water or, in, or indoor plumbing or anything. Uh, and yet, what Satan has, has accomplished is he has set up a scheme to bring it right into the Christian church. So that which a lot of Christians think is just some kind of fable, some kind of myth uh, consigned to the Dark Ages, he has been successful in bringing it right into the Christian church, the Christian community, and it's called spiritualism. It says, <clears throat> it says, spiritualism, which numbers its converts by hundreds of thousands, yet, yea, even millions, which has made its way into scientific circles, which has invaded churches, has found favor in legislative bodies, even in courts of kings. This mammoth deception, it's a mammoth deception. It's one of those things that's going to rally uh, uh, the world's inhabitants under the banner of Satan. This mammoth deception is but a revival in a new disguise of the practice of witchcraft that was condemned in the Old Testament. And that's really what it is. Uh, the whole idea of communicating with the dead is uh, nothing more than, than that. And of course, those people that get involved with that, those people that are caught and locked into that, and I can imagine it would become even some, somewhat addictive you know, if you th if you think you have an in with a with a supernatural being or a friend that has gone before you or a relative that has gone before you, and and you're you're getting, you know, you're privy to certain information that others don't have, you know, that can become kind of addictive, can't it? You know, in fact, I even I even heard of uh, some of our our presidents that. Uh, <clears throat> served in the White House, some of their wives were involved with communicating with evil spirits and so on. I mean, imagine that, right? People at that level in our government being influenced by evil spirits. Does that surprise you? <laughs> doesn't really surprise me, okay? Most of our most recent presidents uh, used mediums and psychics for consulting. It's, it's incredibly big business. I mean, there are people that won't do something, they won't make a major decision in life without getting the advice of a medium, well, they, a horoscope. I mean, the whole nine yards is incredible. They have the California psychics now. They can tell you your, your whole future and everything, what you should and you shouldn't do, and it only cost you a dollar a minute. Yeah, so, I mean, you can, again, if you think you, if you buy into the deception that that uh, your <clears throat> relatives or friends have gone beyond and that they can, they can give you some information that will be important to your life and give your life direction. What gives your life direction? What, what should give your life direction? Only this right here. 
Oh, Ray, was... Reagan's wife got a hold of her uh, psychic every day to get information to give Ronald Reagan when he was in there. No telling how many national policies and decisions have been made at that level based on the counsel from evil spirits. If this thing was true, and you could communicate with the dead, the relatives, my relatives and stuff like that, why would I want to pay a dollar a minute to go through a third party to get the information when I could get it directly from them? Because yeah. you don't have the energy to channel them. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, in this book, Great Controversy, this is one of the most important chapters, uh, Can the Dead Speak to Us? It's an end-time issue, <coughs> very decidedly. Now, one of the things I want to do is, I'll, and, and I want to again show you how easy it is to, to set up a home church environment um, in your own neighborhood, uh, with your own family and friends. You can take a, a study like, like uh, one that uh, is put up by Amazing Facts or, or another organization. Which we can get for them if they need Yeah, are the, are the dead really dead? I mean, any of these materials that we're showing you, uh, we can make available to you. But, uh, Free. Yeah, at no cost. And again, you can go through a study here. And I, I like this one here because it goes right back to the very basic um, area, the very foundation the uh, very first question that they have, and this is in a question-answer format, ask a question, give you a Bible answer. You know, how did we get here in the first place? In other words, if we're going to deal with the subject of death, then we want to even go back before that and find out, well, how did we even begin? You know, instead of talking, uh, instead of starting at the ending, let's start at the beginning. So how did we even begin? And I can have you guys look these verses up, if you will, and that's what this is. This is like a Bible study time, right? And so, uh, somebody look up Genesis 2-7. I think, Larry, you uh, were alluding to this one earlier. Genesis 2-7. How in the world did we get here in the first place? <clears throat> How did humanity become humanity? Okay. What does it say, Genesis 2-7? Now I can read down my little Amplified Bible here. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person, or a living soul. Okay. Yeah, in, in the New King James, it says living being. Okay? In the King James, it says a living soul, I believe. Right? <clears throat> so God made us from the dust of the ground. Now, what they do in this particular lesson here is they say, okay, that's how we, we, we came to get, how we, we began. How, what happens when a person... When a person dies, and Ecclesiastes 12:7. Who would like to take that one? The book of Ecclesiastes 12:7. Yeah, Elijah, you said you'd like to take that one. What does that say? What happens when a person dies? Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it, or soul. Okay, so what's taking place here? Mm -hmm. um, it's a full the, circle. Step to the board here for just a second. He starts from here. dust, he returns to and again, dust. you don't need to have... They're using that spirit, you know, wrong. That spirit is your breath. Okay, so dust... That's the beginning. That becomes the body, right? That's the beginning. And the breath... Right? That's the, that's the breath of life. Man becomes a living soul. Okay. Or a person. All right. In full circle. And that's the spark of what well, it's like a spark the spark of life, right? Right. Okay. <clears throat> so Genesis 2 7 says God forms man of the dust, and then he breathes into him the breath of life, or the spark of life, whatever you want to call it. And man becomes right? Baby and baby. Or something. Yes. Yeah. Well, man becomes a living being or soul, living soul. Without the breath of life, you're a dead soul. Okay, so now what happens? What happens at death? Well, you're not even a soul. The Bible says that it's the combination of the body and the breath of God that make you a soul. Right. So, so both of these things, you're not either. You're both not of those things have to be together. Okay. Yeah, you can when they're together, when they're together, you're a living being, right? It's now, sort of like a light. 
a, a, a lamp, you know, and then you got the light bulb. <coughs> well, it, that light bulb ain't worth a dime unless you got the the spark of life. The electricity. Mm -hmm. Electricity. Then it becomes it can be used. It's there. It's free. Okay, so we're 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 a combination of two things. That makes us a living being. That makes us a living soul. Okay, right. so people use that term. Now, what happens when one of those? What happens when the breath of life ceases? You're a dead soul okay. or a dead body. Okay, dead. Period. When when one of those when when the breath goes back to God, right? Mm -hmm. Who gave it? And that wait wait wait. And the body goes back to wait. That is what goes back to God. Nothing more. Right. Is in other words, it just ceases. It doesn't go anywhere. It just ceases to exist. Well, it's like the light. Uh, Flick the switch, you, it's all. You cut the electricity. It didn't go anywhere. And the light goes away. Right. It didn't. Right. The, the electricity didn't go anywhere. It just ceased to function. Right. So, it's a combination of the two things. Uh, I've heard it expressed, too, with, you know, just building a box. You've got, you know, screws and, and boards. You put them together. You have a box. You take the screws out. You put them over here, you put the boards over here, the box is no longer there. It ceases to exist. You know, I find that a lot of times in the Bible when it uses the word spirit or soul in reference to your life, uh, the word that it's translated from is uh, in Hebrew, it's ruach, I think is what it is. Ruach. Mm -hmm. Ruach. Which just means like wind or breath. Right. So it's not like a, a you know, an ethereal creature. It's not an entity. It's not a conscious yeah. entity. It's not like an electrical Fairy that floats around, you know, it's just a breath, air. You know. <laughs> right. Well, you're good. I'm telling you. You like that, huh? <laughs> you know, uh, when God, I think, you took Ezekiel out in the desert and asked him, with all these bones laying there, you know, he asked him, can these bones live? And he said, Thou knowest, you know, Ezekiel said, Thou knowest. Anyway, he said, <coughs> told uh, Ezekiel to uh, prophesy unto these bones. Say unto these bones, yes. Come, uh, uh, come together, and they come together. And then he told him to prophesy about the skin, the hyssop, you know, to come up on them. Mm -hmm. Then he commanded the uh, the, and had him to command the four winds come and blow upon these that they might live and he uh, prophesied and the wind come and anyway the breath that caused the breath to go back in him mm -hmm. he <clears throat> compares this to the end resurrection you know of what he's doing Sure. Anyway, they stood up on their feet, you know, as an exceeding great army. Right. <clears throat> and, you know, you're mentioning the resurrection. You referenced the resurrection there. And that's kind of what happens at the resurrection. And, I mean, if you were to go and to dig up anybody that's been dead for any length of time, what's in the grave? What's in the, great, what's in the thing? The it's dust, dust okay? It's dust dust and bones or whatever. Um, and, of course, when Christ comes and he resurrects them, What's coming out of the grave? Us. A new body. person, a new person in a glorified body. A new body. person. You're going, I don't yeah. know you when I see you. You're going to look like you are. Yeah, so a new glorified body. The only difference is you're going to have a glorified body. So God's doing the same thing again. He's taking the dust <laughs> and he's making a new body out of it and he's bringing back the breath of life and again we're having the same thing happen all over again. At the resurrection. They don't come down. So if it happened the first time, which we know it did, or we wouldn't be here, right. then it's going to happen the second time. Sure, absolutely. Now, this little lesson here, this little guide here, goes uh, to that uh, in the direction that Elijah was talking about with the Spirit. What is the Spirit that returns to God in de at death? And James 2.26 and Job 27.3 says, The body without the Spirit is dead, James 2.26. And the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, Job 27.3. So the Spirit that returns to God at death is the breath of life. <clears throat> Nowhere in all of God's Word does the word Spirit have any life or wisdom or feeling after a person dies. It's the breath of life, it's the spark of life, uh, nothing more. Now let's talk a little bit about what a soul is. 
The Bible says that that combination makes us a living soul. And when a person ends up dying, and the breath of life ceases in them, goes back to God, and the <clears throat> body goes back to the dust, the soul really ceases to exist. No longer are you a, a living soul. You know, now they prove that science can actually make a body, but you can't make the body live. They can right. actually form right. and make one, but they can't give it the breath of life, right. that spark, spark of life, right. no matter what they do. Now, I think the, some of the confusion comes in <clears throat> because of the terminology. You know, we say spirit, and some people say soul, and, you know, those words are used sometimes inter yeah, lot, yeah, a lot interchangeably. interchangeably. <clears throat> but, but Ezekiel says, Ezekiel 18.20, the soul that sinneth, it what what die? It shall die. Okay. And that word so, that he's no longer. He won't give him another spark of life. Right. So there's no there's no this whole, all concept of an immortal soul that many organizations teach about <clears throat> is a misnomer. There's uh, no such thing as an immortal soul. Okay. God only. God only had immortality. That's in First Timothy. Every living soul. This uh, Revelation talked about at the end. It said every living soul in the sea die. According to God's word, souls do die. We are souls, and souls die. Men is mortal. Only God is immortal. Wait a minute. If a soul dies, how can it go to heaven? Well, right. Sure. You know, uh, it tells you, you know, I, I, I don't know where to look, but uh, it tells you that, well, they're going to be a, a, a punishment. But you're going to burn, you know, uh, completely up like a burned up piece of stove wood. Yeah, and it will be as though you never were. You ain't going to stand there and burn for a million years. Well, Malachi 4, chapter 1st, verse says you'll be ashes under the sole of the saint's feet. Yeah. How can you be an ash if you're going to burn for eternity? It'll be as though you never well, were to begin with. You won't be punished. Well, I was going to say, well, even to believe that is to say that you as a human being have more mercy in your being than God does. Because to punish someone for eternity, for maybe, say you only lived to be 20, but you died an unrepentant sinner, and you get punished for all eternity, the same as someone before the flood who lived to be almost a thousand and sinned their whole life. Right. And, uh, you know, they've been burning ever since. And no equity. Then where's the justice in that? Yeah, no justice. Yeah, I mean, there's no mercy, there's no justice. And we're kind of getting, torture someone we're kind of getting off. Uh, off subject a little bit, but but the reason is is because, and that's what we'll be looking at next week. Those two subjects kind of go hand in glove. In other words, if you have an immortal soul in you, as some organizations teach, which is not biblical, um, <clears throat> but it, but it, if some people buy that or some people accept that, then if you are wicked, what do you do with an immortal soul if you're wicked? Right, you got to put it somewhere. You had to put it somewhere, and it has to be someplace forever in torment. And so the, the, the whole issue of eternal torment is goes hand in glove with this subject here. And that's why the eternal torment doctrine developed because of the, the uh, misunderstanding of the immortal soul. You have, if you have an, something immortal that doesn't die, if you can't die and you're wicked, well, we've got to put you someplace and torture you for all eternity. So that's why that ended up developing. We'll talk about that next week. And there is no such thing as a love of oh, God. It's doing a, oh, that, that's, that's, a, that's the most satanic scheme out there because it, it, gives, it makes God responsible for all that. It makes him out to be the bad guy. Yeah. Okay, that's what it's designed to do. Okay, we'll talk about that next week, though. But number six here says, uh, do good people go to heaven when they die? Now, there are a lot of good people, of course, that, that have passed on. And, uh, of course, there are a lot of, of uh, wicked people that have passed on. So what happens? In John 5, 28 and 29, it says, All who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. So there'll be, according to John chapter 5, 28 and 29, there'll be two resurrections. There'll be a resurrection of the righteous and there'll be a resurrection of the wicked. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. It says, David, you remember King David? Uh, God called him his friend, right? David was a friend of God. He's both dead I and mean, buried. I mean, is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us today. David did not ascend into the heavens in Acts 2, 29 and 34. So, um, you know, we have to remember that 
you know, so what, what we're talking about, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, these deceptions have been around uh, from, from time and eternity almost. Uh, they've been around for, for quite a long time. Uh, philosophers and people uh, came up with different concepts and ideas a long time ago. And so, you've got to remember, even back during the apostolic time, thousands of years ago, the apostles were dealing with this kind of thing. And so they would just blatantly come out and say, you know, David, a friend of God, one after God's uh, own heart, he's, he's right there in the grave, he hasn't ascended to heaven, he hasn't gone anywhere. And so they, they're trying to clarify some of these deceptions that had come along. And that's the, the thing with deceptions, they're, they're like... Uh, you know, they're like these uh, clothing trends and hairstyle trends and these, these things that come, you know, they go into cycles and come back and back and back uh, over and over again. See, where, sorry, where they get this misconception is that they go straight to heaven, okay? Right. Now, if, if I should die this very minute, my next conscious thought Instantly, he says, in the moment, in the blinking, in the twinkling of an eye, I'm going to be with Christ. <clears throat> That's for me, my next conscious thought. Right, your perception. My per from my perception. I am going to be with Christ within a blink of an eye. Why? Even because though, yeah. I no longer count time. I'm not in the realm of it, 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 time. It, sure. It could be 10,000 years. I won't know it. Right, exactly. Because I'll be asleep. In the grave, waiting, waiting. Right. But I won't know that. The only ones counting time is <clears throat> going to be you. You'll be sitting there counting time, <clears throat> and and time will go on and on. But for as far as I'm concerned, my next conscious thought, I'm in eternity with Christ. Right. As soon as your probation closes, your next yeah. conscious thought will be right with Christ. Yeah. Yeah, so See, so it's oh, while you're in the grave, it's unconscious. You sure. know nothing. Sure. E. Glassy says, you know the dead knoweth nothing. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so Job 17.13 says, If I wait, the grave is mine house. So, people do not go either to heaven or to hell at death. And uh, they go to their graves, and they, like Larry said, they wait for the resurrection day. How much does one comprehend, and this is uh, where you were going, how much does one comprehend or know after death? And uh, <clears throat> this is a pretty long scripture, so I'll just go ahead and read it. Ecclesiastes 9, Psalm 115 are just two. And by no means are we exhausting. You know, uh, Scott here has, uh, looks like he's got about ten pages or so of, uh, of notes here on uh, scriptures that, that he's taken a look at that indicate this very thing. The living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. How much? Nothing. nothing. They don't know anything, okay? They're unconscious. And they have no more reward. In other words, they're not in reality, as Larry said. They're not experiencing any reality at that point. For the memory of them is forgotten, it says. Also their love, it says, also their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. There is, there is no work, no device, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave where you are going. Then how can they be in heaven coming back, giving advice to somebody as to what they can do and can't do and about their exalted positions? They can't. It's That's not an impossibility. It's not possible, is it? Psalm 115 says, The dead do not praise the Lord. And you know, you think about that for a minute. If you were... If you were ushered into the presence of God at death, as, as many teach and believe, wouldn't, wouldn't you be... I mean, you know that the Bible tells us the angels praise God continually. Okay? So if you, if you pop in, what are you going to be doing? You've right? got you, to praise Him. You're going to be praising the Lord, aren't you? Okay? So David says very specifically that the dead do not praise the Lord. And why don't they praise the Lord? Because they're asleep. Because they're not there. Try. They're not there. They're in an unconscious state, right? <clears throat> it says, number eight here says, but can't the dead communicate with the living and aren't they aware of what, what the living are doing? And we'll be looking at Job and also Ecclesiastes 9. It says, uh, so man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. So what are they doing? They're Sleep. Sleeping. They're in an unconscious state. Mm -hmm. 
And they're not going to be doing anything until they're roused from that sleep. And when, and when are they roused from that sleep? At the resurrection. At the resurrection. Yeah. Only at the resurrection. resurrection. Only. His sons come to honor, and he does not know it. How come he doesn't know it? He's asleep. He's unconscious. Right. Just like if somebody came and stood by your bed in the middle of the night and said, Hey, how are you doing? You know, If you're a deep sleeper, you're just going to keep on snoring away. They're not even going to know that you're there. Okay? It says, they are brought low, and he does not perceive it. And uh, that's Job 14, 12 and 21. Nevermore will they have a share in anything under the sun, which is one that we already looked at. The dead cannot contact the living, nor do they know what the living are doing. See? Okay? Because they're, they're in an unconscious state. Okay? <clears throat> they're dead. Their thoughts have perished. That's Psalm 146 and verse 4. So, like I say, you can go through... If people will take the time to go through little studies like this, or uh, even really start digging like Scott's done in his uh, research there, they'll, they'll come to an overwhelming conclusion. Okay. Jerry, there's only one spot throughout all of Scripture that has any kind of whatsoever of indication as the dead speaking to the living, and that was from the witch of Andorra when Saul went to her, and that was nothing more than Satan the witchcraft. taken. Yeah, there's witchcraft, which was number one, she should have been stoned to death, yeah. and because God said, get rid of them. And, and it was just. It was and, here's just the, and here's the king of Israel going to. Well, that was kind of the funny thing. Was, uh, he was, well, I think he was the one, or maybe it was Samuel. That kind of helped push the decree that he did. Saw, uh, King Saul yeah. did. Yeah, because he went to her in disguise first. Right. And she must have actually had some supernatural help because she was able to discern some things that she only would have been able to know if something was telling her. And she knew that it was Saul. And that's that's true. That does happen. But I mean, you see, the thing about what I'm saying <clears throat> is on this deal here, that's the only place. And it is connected with witchcraft. And that was something that uh, Mr. Scott had mentioned earlier on the, uh, the stream. was that King Saul's death slash destruction occurred right after he consulted the woman of Endor. And but, even disguised himself as Samuel and deceived Saul. But that's where they get this false belief from this one teaching, from this one verse right here. That's where they get the false belief that the living or the dead can talk with the living. That's where they get all this from. So and it's attached <clears throat> to witchcraft. It says here, I'm um, reading again from the uh, Great Controversy, uh, the same, same chapter we were talking about earlier. It says, Many endeavor to account for the spiritual manifestations by attributing them wholly to fraud and sleight of hand on the part of the medium. And it, it says here, But while it is true that the results of trickery have often been plant, uh, palmed off as genuine manifestations, there have been also marked exhibitions of supernatural power. Um, and one of those that's brought out here, we didn't do our reading this morning, and I, we, we could go back and do it uh, at the end here, maybe we'll do that. But it said, um, um, it said in this chapter, it says, These persons overlook the testimony of Scripture concerning the wonders wrought by Satan and his agents. It was by satanic aid that Pharaoh's magicians were enabled to counterfeit the work of God. Remember, right. as we were reading through our scripture there <clears throat> on, on uh, the Exodus, how uh, Moses and Aaron would go in and they would do something. God would say, you know, throw down your staff or do this or that. And then the magicians would come and do that. They were, <clears throat> they were actually aided by, by uh, angels, uh, the demons. We call them demons, fallen angels, demons to actually perform kind of the same thing, or seem to... To, uh, to make it look like, make it it look like the same thing was happening. So, and that's true. So, so there, sometimes it's a scheme, it's a trick. It's, uh, you know, people are being, being uh, seduced in that way. Yeah. And other times, it's uh, very, very, uh, very, very real, very, very supernatural. For example, um, I'm sure that if we asked our audience out there... Has anyone ever been, has anyone ever seen an apparition? Has anybody ever, uh, a relative or, or a friend, appeared to you? Right? I mean, that's a, that would be a very real experience if, if you saw one of your dead relatives or, or dead friends co come to you and start talking to you. Okay, that would be something pretty shocking, wouldn't it? Something pretty real, 
right? You, you couldn't discount that as some kind of a trick, right? But that kind of thing happens, and what's that designed to do? Satan can take any form he wants. Manipulate your emotion. Mm -hmm. It's designed to try to prove to you something that is not scriptural, okay? Mm -hmm. But that's traditional, that's that's being accepted by by the masses. But it goes right back to what I was just now saying. It's to deal with the emotions. Get the person's emotions, yeah. and you get the person. Absolutely. Okay, number nine in this little study here, it says, uh, Jesus called the unconscious state of death, he called it a sleep. And uh, John 11, now uh, then we could turn there in our Bibles, John chapter 11. <clears throat> What's John chapter 11 the story of? Anybody remember? If Lazarus. Anybody know Lazarus, right. If Jesus called it a sleep, then buddy, it has to be a sleep period. <clears throat> And if he actually did go to heaven, why on earth would he bring him back? <laughs> Good exactly. point. Good yeah. point. I mean, when Lazarus... I can see Lazarus come back right now. <laughs> what the Jesus. Deal? Say, what in the world were you good. doing? I was in paradise and I was happy. And you bring me back to this? Yeah, I can see that happen. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things, now, now that you mentioned that, one of the other things that's become very uh, popular uh, and also designed to try to promote this deception is uh, <clears throat> when people supposedly are on the operating table or, uh, or uh, they're in an accident of some kind or they, they, they take some medication and they go unconscious, they, uh, <clears throat> they end up going, uh, they end up being revived and then they have this story to tell about how they were going down this long tunnel and there was a light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Or, or they, uh, or, or they actually were projected up over top of their bodies, and they could, they were watching the paramedics and people trying to revive them. And some people have given accounts where, hey, I went to heaven, you know, and God said to me, hey, I still have a work for you to do. You got to go back. And then, you know, I see them reviving me, and then I go back into my body, kind of thing. And so you, you have this, uh, what's it, astral projection? That type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a lot of stories out there like that. People that have gone unconscious, they've technically, clinically died, and they were revived. And after being revived, they have this story that they went somewhere. They were in heaven. They visited with their grandparents and their relatives that had passed on. And, and they. So you have all these kind of things that, that continually adds fuel to the fire of something that is not true. Okay. But because it touches the emotion, you see, because it grabs people emotionally, they say, and if you've experienced that yourself, if you, if you had that experience yourself, you know that it was real, okay? But, but uh, let me just say that when your heart stops, and blood stops pumping through your veins, there's a CO2 buildup in the brain, right? right? And just like if you take drugs, hallucinogenic drugs, or even alcohol, if you drink a lot of alcohol, if you build up in your bloodstream a lot of CO2, like the box, you're going to hallucinate. Right. Okay? If you cut the oxygen level down, you're going to hallucinate. And people have all kinds of crazy hallucinations. Well, the same thing technically happens when a person dies or, 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 or the heart stops. There's a CO2 buildup in the brain, so they, in the, the mind, they're starting to hallucinate. And then when they're revived and become conscious again, they remember. They remember this, this hallucination that they had, like, like a dream that you would remember. Well, what's funny is people from all different religious things report basically what they believe they should see. Um, you know, people that are Buddhists and those other people believe that when they've died, they've seen their past lives and you know, everything that they've lived out according to reincarnation they saw in that instant. You know, people just kind of see what their mind thinks they should see to make sense of dying. You know, I think uh, as the brain is, you know, losing oxygen and shutting down the body, it's trying to make sense of it so it doesn't, you know, so it goes naturally. Sure. Well, face it, if, if I'm in that kind of a state, and I've actually made it into heaven, he ain't getting me back. Just because he says, I've got more work for you to do, I'm going to say, well, send somebody else, because I ain't going back. You know, Larry, I think Come on, face it. I was thinking about that uh, the scripture you were mentioning earlier when you were talking about um, them basing like, you know, the state of the dead off of. And I think what it's actually based off of is the scripture that says to be absent from the body is to be present. With right, the body. yes. And that's the one that I hear most commonly from Paul. for people to say. Right. I mean, that's one scripture out of all the 
Hundreds yeah. Of other scriptures yeah. say that death is sleep. You know nothing. You're right. Dead don't praise anything. They're just dead. You're in the grave. You're in the ground. You got five thousand <laughs> quotes of this, and then you have one that says. Present from the Paul says, "Present from the body is to be with the Lord." Now, what they're going to do? They're going to build a whole, a whole theory on that one verse and throw the other five thousand out. You give it to Hollywood, and they can do anything with it that <laughs> that Satan wants. Like uh, uh, Paul Wells' movie that he had made out, or he advertised a lot, "Escape from Hell." Mm-hmm. That's the same thing, and Hollywood can really, they really made a, a deal out of that. I've never seen it, but he advertised it on TV enough. What was we in, John? John we were in John 11, before I kind of got, got us off down there, Rabbit Trail. Verse 11 to 14. And uh, in verse 11, it says, uh, These things he said, and after he, he had uh, said to them, my friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. And of course the disciples, they said, Lord, if he sleeps, he, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about <coughs> taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I'm <clears throat> glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. And of course, uh, we know the story how Jesus went and... Uh, from verse 17 on down, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jer- uh, Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many of the Jews had joined the women <clears throat> around uh, Martha and Mary, her, his uh, sisters, to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. And what does Martha say? I know he will at the end. I know he will again in the resurrection at the last day. You see, so she kn- she understands uh, you know, how things work. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may be dead, he shall live. Yeah, in other and words, course, I don't want Scott Spark to laugh. Yeah, so we know that uh, Jesus prayed and and honored, the Father honored his request, and Lazarus was raised. But you notice when Jesus was talking there, even Jared's daughter says, she's not dead, she's asleep. Right. Paul says, Dorcas, she's not dead, she's asleep. Right, well, over it. over 50 times in the yeah. New Testament, it, it, it refers to... Uh, death is asleep. Death is asleep. Job, uh, Job 14 and Second Peter 3, it says, So men lie down and does not rise. Till the heavens are no more. Until when? The heavens are no more. See? That's Job That's 14, 12. The day of the Lord will come, in which the heavens will pass away, it says in, in Second Peter. The dead will sleep until the great day of the Lord at the end of the world. In death, humans are totally unconscious, with no activity or knowledge of any kind. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, that's what... Uh, in fact... You know, you were saying 